Right, Talal, we're moving on now, moving on to operations. Okay, operations co covers a whole range of things in relation to, it's basically about how you make and produce the goods or services that you're wanting to get to the market. So we're going to look at, we're going to look at inventory management, we're going to look at, I'm going to give you a, a short background to production, including suppliers and all these sorts of things on operations. Uh, and then there'll be further videos about just-in-time stock control, uh, quality. So we'll go through it and we'll have a look at the holistic learning objectives, you know, for the first part of operations. So we're looking at uh, what you should be aware of, uh, the purpose of an inventory management control system. Remember that inventory and stock are interchangeable. Okay, I prefer you to use the word inventory. It just makes you sound more like higher people. But you can use stock if, if needs be. Okay, and w within that control system, we'll start looking, we'll look at a diagram, the, the traditional stock control model or inventory control model, and you've got the maximum level, uh, why you set it, the minimum level, why you set it at a particular level, reorder level, reorder quantity, what the buffer inventory is, and a term that you need to get familiar with, which is lead time. Okay, lead time basically just means the time you have to wait before you receive your goods. We're also going to look, which we'll do in a second video, uh, the features, costs and benefits of just-in-time inventory control. Uh, and then we'll do inventory storage and warehousing. Again, I'll do a very a short video on that. And then we'll do the logistical management of inventory. We're going to cover most of that in the first part. So the process of dealing with the whole order from start to finish. So there'll be a small part of that, and I'll probably stick that on to the end of inventory storage and warehousing. But if it's as a single you know, learning objective, uh, that covers off, I'll co cover a bit of it in a minute or two, but I think there's there's more to know about basically how you ensure the fact that you get your product to the consumer starting at the very beginning and how it moves around. The background to operations is basically, there are a number of questions you have to ask, so I've got some up there, as first of all, what do you want to produce? What is it that you're actually going to be making, right? What order are we going to produce it in? And there's the great thing, do we put the chicken before the egg, do we, how do we, you know, do you make the, the wheels in the car and then put the engine in or do you put the engine in first and then the wheels, you know, so you've got to get an idea uh, of what these things are. So we've got what to produce, which I've put on twice there, which is very efficient of me, right, uh, how do you ensure quality? Why do you want to ensure quality? Because you, you want your consumer to be coming back and buying more of. You also don't want to be receiving goods back that are defective quality because it tarnishes your reputation and also it doesn't help with your cost base, it can be loss because what you've done is you've completed a, a full product, there's a defect within that product, it goes to the consumer, your reputation is harmed, they then send it back to you right? and then you have to basically just scrap it. So that comes down, that leads on to the next question is how to be efficient. You know, how to be efficient, are we going to automate, are we going to use loads of labour, you know, what kind of systems are we going to put in place? So these are all questions that you have to ask yourself when you're looking at operations. Right? There's always a process, and this is what I say to everybody, an input, a process, and an output. So pictorially there, I've put it down as, like, you've got your raw materials. Raw materials there, so in that case we've got lumber. That is your first, right, coming from the primary sector. Right? You've got your raw materials, so it could be metal, could be wood, could be anything, could be rubber from a rubber plantation. You then put that through a process which we classify as manufacturing. All right, So manufacturing, a process of where it is taken from its raw state, uh, there's a process, value is added, if you remember and go back into your brain from right at the very beginning and understanding business, right? we're adding value. And then what we're doing is we're, put, we're finishing that off. Once we've got it, we're making it either into a finished or a semi-finished good. Now, I've got finished goods there in the, a warehouse ready to be sent out and logistically delivered to consumers. But it could sometimes be that you're producing a semi-finished good. All right, so it could be, for instance, that you are producing a computer monitor. Hey, and part of that is you deal with... You know, only part of that install, like the plastic casing or something along those sorts of lines. So your factory could be the plastic casing, so it's a semi-finished good, but then what it does is it goes to another part of the process where they put in the screen and they put in the other things, and then it becomes a, a finished good. So be aware, especially in the industrial market, semi-finished goods are often produced by um, different manufacturers. Okay, so there you are, three distinct phases for you to look at. What happens in the initial stage? Where do you get your materials from? When you're manufacturing, how do you manufacture it? Remember those questions. 
how am I going to be efficient, how am I going to ensure quality, and then your finished goods at the end, or your semi-finished goods, how do we get them to our consumer? What do we do? Do we hold them all in one place? Do we centrally? So they will come as we go through the process, we go through uh, uh, operations in general terms. That's it written for you there. So input, process, output. So it's the buying of raw materials and hiring the labour as the input. The process is using the resources to produce products. Right, for sale, including machinery, so you need a skilled workforce. Notice you're going to start interweaving a lot here, right? Because what we're talking about is labour, right? You go back to the factors of enterprise, land, labour, capital, and enterprise. Resources to produce products for sale, including machinery and a skilled workforce. So you're talking about capital there, and also you're looking at skilled workforce. When we go on to HR, we'll look at training and motivation and all these sorts of things, all right? And the benefits that that brings to an organisation. And then you've got your output, where your good or your services are packaged and sent out to the suppliers. Right? So you then bring into that the channel of distribution, which we've covered off in marketing. So you really now are building, you put your building blocks together, right, to get this all into, you know, one package. You know, because remember, it is all about producing something that a consumer wants to purchase. Right? So you've got to get that done, get that idea, and start seeing all these threads kind of coming together. All right? Suppliers, right? So where are you going to, where are you going to get your input from? Right, where are we going to get our raw materials right, from? You're going to get them from a supplier. Okay? But I always say to people in my class, why, why do you go to a particular shop? Why do you go right, to a particular clothes shop, retail shop? Hey, why do you use the corner shop rather than waiting and go to Tesco? Or Aldi or whatever. There are a number of reasons for that. Okay? And it's sometimes called the supplier mix. It's not asked hey, specifically in hire anymore. Right, as far as I can see from the spec sheet, but hey, I think it's good for you to know holistically. So what you're looking for for your supplier, you're looking firstly for what are the, what's their prices? And what are their credit terms? Are they going to basically be, are they going to ask us to pay straight away? You know, or are they going to give us quite a long time to pay to allow us basically maybe to build up some capital first and then pay for our raw materials? The thing I would always say to everybody about pricing is it's not always the lowest price that is the best price. Okay, you've got to make that distinction because the, it depends on the quality of the product that you are purchasing and you're producing. Like Primark and Louis Vuitton are not going to use the same quality of product. So they're obviously going to be different prices. So it's not the lowest price, it is the best price for the quality you require. And that leads on to the quality of goods. Right? What are you looking for? The quality of goods you're getting for your supplier. You know, it could be the fact that you buy machinery or, you know, or anything along those sorts of lines. What's the service like? I spent years in the service industry, and it was all about making people feel good. That's what hospitality is all about, okay? So you're working, and it's always this thing of, you know, remember people's names, do all these sorts of things, build up a really strong relationship. You know, I watched thousands upon thousands, millions of pounds worth of deals being done, right, at local and golf club, just because people would remember people's names, right, and you were brought there to feel good. And that's exactly what you would do. It's all about the service, leaving the customer with a good impression. So does your supplier give you that service? You know, what is the lead time? Lead time is, again, we'll come on to that. How long will it take them when we order to get the product to us? Right? And you'll find that that comes into location as well. And I was explaining to my class the other day, for instance, when the Nissan factory set up down in Sunderland in times of great economic hardship for that area, the Nissan factory set up, and it was done through regional assistance, which is something the government did. So they gave them money to build a factory there. But what also happened at that stage was the ancillary products that are used for producing that car, right? Some of their factories started to spring up in areas located close by. So that made really easy. It was made really easy for Nissan if they were looking for things like semiconductors, bulbs, you know, all these sorts of things that go into the making of a car tires, right? They were close by. So once this large Nissan factory had been there, right, all of the suppliers, right, started to congregate in areas around there. So that's something, you know, if you're, it depends how big you are, about how your, what your location is. And that's down to lead time. And especially now with just in time, you're not ordering till basically you've got an order for your consumer. And you've got to make sure that's right. And reliability and reputation, I can't even see it, put my teeth in, reliability and reputation. Uh, so your reputation is something that's hard fought to win, uh, and it's very easy to lose. So that's not only in business terms, that's in uh, general terms in life as well, especially when you're teaching teenagers. So 
Are they reliable? Do you have a long-standing better relationship with them? The more reliable they are, the better your relationship will be with them. Okay, if they can say to you, I will deliver on time all the time, I'll give you the best quality, that's what you want. You don't want somebody to come in, a, 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 basically a fly bunny, who would say, I right, will give you 50% off. So you start to build with them and then what happens is they've disappeared in six months, the company's gone bust. Right? They were sourcing products from an, an unreliable source. Right? So that dries up. So having a really strong reputation in business as in life eh, is a very critical thing to build and work on, all right? Purchasing functions, so what do they do? You know, what do these guys do? If anybody was ever to say, Ben, would you talk about this? But, you know, what does a buyer do? Anybody in a hire people that writes a buyer buy stuff should be shot, right? You've got to have a look at, you know, the, the wider thing. So the purchasing function is there to enable the fact to make sure you've got sufficient stock or inventory available, right? To ensure the fact that you're not wasting any stock. We're talking about, and I talk about it all the time, there are your two lines. There's your income and there's your costs. What you're trying to do all the time is that, right? Reduce your costs or increase your income. So if you reduce waste, you're obviously going to be protecting your bottom line, okay? Having the correct quality. Correct quality is about what you are producing, right? So the correct quality is different for different people and different manufacturers. We know that through different shops and different places that we purchase stuff. So the, having the correct quality for what you require eh, is very important. The, uh, the stuff is in the factory when it's required. There are no delays. You know, if you have got the order from somebody, you've got the stuff there. It's like baking a cake, I always say, right? That moment when you basically your kids come home and you know they're, they're desperate, you've got to make something for school, right? So you basically go into the cupboards because you've got to make cupcakes and you're like, oh, right, where's that vanilla essence from like three years ago I bought and the flour and all these sorts of things. You've got to make sure. I generally runs it with a, you know, I've got to run down to Tesco or something along those sorts of things. So making sure that that doesn't happen, making sure that I have got all the stuff I have before I start to produce my order. But otherwise it leads to delays, hassle, right, all the things that come with it. And that can lead to a poor reputation because you don't deliver, right? Paying competitive prices. That's what buyers do. They negotiate. They talk about terms with people. They take people out for lunches. They talk about deals, right? So you've got to get in competitive prices. Notice I've not used the word lowest prices, right? It is the best price for the best quality that you are looking for for any particular product. That quality can range from good to good. So again, they are subjective and it's down to what you and what you're thinking about. And then building those good relationships. How are you building good relationships, right? Are you basically ensuring the fact that you are, you know, that's a truism, are you taking them out to play golf? Are you, you know, ensuring the fact you're going to visit them on a regular basis? Are you making sure that if they're one of your preferred suppliers, they know that? Right, then they basically you go and visit them and you talk to them. People buy off of people, so uh, they're now called relationship managers. They go out and make sure that they build these relationships. They are the single point of focus or contact for that organisation. So the purchasing function has got a really important job because they are trying to keep costs down while getting the stuff that you need, the inventory you need to produce top quality goods and services. Now, there's two pictures I've got here, and I think they're quite, uh, they point out quite well uh, the difference. So manufacturing, manufacturing's changed over the years, right? From the, uh, the from the model you can see as you're looking on the screen on my right, right, which is basically very labour intensive. Uh, that's taken from somewhere in the far east, and that's a, a garment factory, and you can see it's just rows of thousands of people in sewing machines, right? And that can be done due to the fact that the cost of labour. Right, and the Far East eh, is basically so much lower. Right, so that's very labour intensive. On the other hand, what you've got on the other side is you've got very, you've got automation and robotics. That's very capital intensive. Each of those machines there, it costs thousands upon thousands of pounds. That's a car assembly line. When I talk to people about capital intensive against labour intensive, the one thing that exists today is no matter what you see, at some stage within capital intensive or automation or robotic production, there is some human element. Who fixes the machines? Who programs the machines? All right, so the, the, the person, the human being at this time is not taken out of the process completely. 
So you've got to make sure that you're converting your raw materials into a finished product, and it'll depend upon how much money you have, right? How you can, your scalability of your business. Can you basically go from making it, you know, in a back shop somewhere? You know, can you go and buy the machinery that allow you to produce in at larger scales? Right? There's the what I'm talking about there, technology, human resources, computer aided design, like all these sorts of things come in at this stage. Right? So if you're linking it to different subjects like graphic design, right, you can look at that. You've got the the whole thing with labour intensive and especially there's a big ethical thing there in relation to labour intensive production. Alright, so manufacturing. Got to make sure that you're doing it ethically, right? You, you remember all the, the, the hoo-ha about Nike having kids stitching footballs, right? Uh, Pre-mark, getting nine-year-old Bangladeshi girls. You had to sew the sequins, individual sequins, onto T-shirts to be sold in the UK, which caused a big furore, which put people off. So you've got to protect your reputation and make sure your supply chain is well managed by your relationship managers or your buyers or your purchasing, or your purchasing department. And then there's the last one here, which it's a good graphic there actually, right? Which I found online. Uh, how it gets to the consumer? What's the packaging like? So we had a good discussion yesterday, and I was talking about the Apple packaging, how it's got it's actually designed to have a slow release, right? So there's that moment of waiting, and that you know, until the top comes off the box. As a lot of the kids pointed out, it's all about the fact that yeah, how many people have dropped their iPhones because they're trying to get the thing out and they start shaking it. Uh, so packaging, also. And thought process goes into packaging. Amazon done a fantastic thing. They brought in the rip strip. Okay, that was because the, the main annoyance for anything into a parcel was basically, well, you have to get a key to cut down the sellotape tape which holds the box together. Not with Amazon anymore. They basically give you a rip strip so you can get into your product as quickly as possible. It shows you basically how, you know, how we want that instant gratification all the time and Amazon are giving us it. So they try to think about packaging. How are we going to package it? How are we going to get it to a consumer? What does it look like? Does it have the Amazon logo? In fact, Amazon are using their packaging, you know, in some of their adverts just now. Storage. How is it stored? Is it stored in central warehouses? Is it stored in smaller warehouses? Is it stored at all because uh, we've got our suppliers storing it for us? Does it have to be refrigerated? Does it have to be, uh, you know, kept? It's obviously got to be kept dry and all these sorts of things, right? What are the security measures taken on board? So there are loads of things to be covered off there about storage. Distribution is how you get it about. And distribution and transport both link into the same thing, right? As far as I'm concerned, right? How is it distributed? I was saying to the class the other day about my green beans from Kenya that I had for my dinner on Saturday night. It's amazing to think that there I was in Oban on Saturday night sitting having my dinner. Hey, and I thought, I'll oh, just look at the packet because I say that to the kids all the time. And there you go, my green beans came from Kenya. When I think about Kenya, right, I think about the Maasai Mara and the desert and safaris. I'm not thinking about growing green beans. But how did Tesco get them? Right? With green beans, they probably flew into the country because they've got a very short uh, lifespan. So you've got to think about how do you get it from where it is grown to the consumer. I was watching a programme yesterday about the guy that grows the most cauliflowers uh, in the UK, down in Devon and Cornwall. Right, and he was showing you that they actually harvest them. Right, they, they, three people were with a machine, cut it, right, cut it off, up out the deck, and then put it onto a machine, and that was it. It then got packed in that machine in the field, right, and then when that machine returned back to the farmhouse or the, the factory or the warehouse, it was never touched again by your human hand until the next person who touched it was uh, the consumer when they were putting it in their pot. Really interesting. So transport, how does it get there? And you should know from National 5 the good and bad things about everything. So you've got container ships, right? Most of our stuff that's produced is produced in the Far East. Okay, all the electrical goods, clothing, all these sorts of things. And they come into the big ports such as Southampton. Uh, Liverpool, not so much anymore, but, you know, they're there. It's mainly on the South Coast, you know, where you can get these super tankers in. You know, aeroplanes, what are the good and bad things about aeroplanes? They're really quick, right? But again, they're really expensive, cause a lot of pollution. Trains can t carry loads of weights of stuff. Right? But however, they don't go door to door. They go to a central point. So you then have to get road involved to carry things from the train to the actual location. And you've got delivery vans there, you've got people on mopeds, you've got all these sorts of things which you have to think about. Down to the fact we were discussing the other day hey, with somebody from university who had just been at university. And what they were saying is you can see all these guys coming around the, with the bikes now, Deliveroo, right? And you can order like a Chinese or a pizza or whatever it might be. You know, and these these guys will come and deliver it to your door and a big bike with a big hot box on the front of it. 
So it's really interesting. All right, so that's logistics. How do you get it out to the consumer? So I'll actually finish doing a video on that just now because there's 20 minutes in that and I'll come on to inventory management in the next video that I do.